Silicon Flatirons is a research center at Colorado Law School. We work with students to give them the tools they need to pursue careers in tech, law, policy, and entrepreneurship. When I started, Silicon Flatirons was an experiment. It was me and some students putting on a few conferences without really a plan where it was gonna go. My initial motivation was because I didn't believe you could have impactful policy discussions unless you brought people together across different disciplines. Silicon Flatiron Center has given me an image of what a team can look like. And it really made Boulder into a location that was seen as on par with DC or Silicon Valley and other places around the country that are leading thought centers in the field of law and tech. What's excited me uh, the most is to see it grow, but not only just grow in terms of the number of people attending our different events, but growing in terms of the different areas that we have been involved in. When a law student says, I've got a passion for understanding the intersection of technology and law, but where do I get started with that? What Flatirons provides is addition to actually go angle for a job during their second summer, where they're actually gonna to get to be involved directly in setting tech policy or in advocating around tech policy. The Silicon Flatirons community is incredibly unique in how close it is and how people are willing to band together to move conversations forward. It's one thing to be sitting in a room by yourself reading articles, and it's very much another thing to actually be sitting at a table talking to somebody about their daily experiences of trying to navigate compliance with a complex new law. We're all a community of uh, friends who enjoy spending time with one another. The people we engage with through here are very much thinkers and thought leaders, so they're contributing to whether it's our strategy or our resources in really meaningful ways. Uh, Silicon Flatirons has changed the dynamic between Colorado law and the surrounding community as well as the national community. One of the great joys of my profession is talking to people who are really early in their careers and helping them get excited about what you're excited about. We get the types of people in the room that everyone thinks should be talking to one another, but often are not. I get to work with students, I get to work with attorneys, I get to work with policymakers at the intersection of all these issues. Students are first and foremost, so uh, everything is generally student-driven. And it is centered around people who are wanting to engage with students. I've seen students uh, come into Silicon Flatirons just having a little interest in it, you know, in year one, and by year three, uh, they're passionate about it and they found their career. And I think that that really helps the um, standing of the university more broadly, and it also attracts lots of really interesting and talented speakers. I think what I'm excited to see happen with Silicon Flatirons in the next five, ten, even twenty years is for it to blend continuity with change. It's not enough to have smaller conversations anymore. The world is all connected, and Silicon Flatirons is going to reflect that global nature of the internet as we move forward into 20 years in the future. I hope it continues to operate with the same spirit of experimentation, of adventure, of seeking out new challenges that we've done over the first 20 years. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amy Stepanovich, and I'm the Executive Director of Silicon Flatirons, and I'm so honored to be able to welcome you here with us today virtually. I can't wait till we can be back together in the same room, when I can connect with you one-on-one -on -one and hear more about what you're thinking about or what you're working on. It's been a great inspiration to me to see that sense of shared community that's present at every one of our events that I attend. And I'm so glad we can continue in that tradition, even when we're not together. If this is your first Silicon Flatirons event, I welcome you. Silicon Flatirons has a mission to elevate the debate around technology law, policy, and entrepreneurship, to spark tomorrow's conversations through intellectually honest programming and community engagement. I wanna thank our staff, our speakers, and our full community for helping to inspire and execute the programming that you're going to see here today. And a special thank you to our supporters. It was so important to us to be able to provide the programming you're about to see free of charge so that it could be accessible by anyone, regardless of any hardship they may be facing. We're so appreciative of our supporters' generosity so we can continue to serve our full community. If you enjoy today's program 
and you want to help us create more like it. And if you have the means, we would welcome a donation to Silicon Flatirons today. Every dollar you make has a long and lasting impact. And if you'd like to help us, you can go to siliconflatirons.org and click on the donate button. Thank you again so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy today's program. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thank you very much uh, um, for uh, helping us put on this event, Vanessa. Vanessa has really been amazing in pulling everything together. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here um, as we uh, discuss um, the, uh, the, this hard issue of thinking about uh, the use of health data during the COVID epidemic. I am seeing that there may be some technical difficulties still. Um, uh, apparently there are some people who cannot hear audio. Um, so I'm just gonna um, uh, turn that over to Law IT. I see that in the chat. Um, before we begin, um, I do want to um, uh, acknowledge um, uh, the um, a standard acknowledgement that the University of Colorado Law School um, seeks to offer um, before uh, our events starting this year, um, which is to acknowledge that wherever we are, we are meeting on the lands of First Nations peoples. Uh, the traditional owners of the land in Boulder are the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and the Ute Nations. And I'd like to pay particular respect to the elders past, present, and emerging who lead these communities. Um, and I also want to thank um, all my panelists um, who are here during such a hectic time um, to discuss this very important issue. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm just going to introduce the panelists and then um, the way this is going to work, which is the standard format of a Silicon Flatirons event, is um, I'm going to pose a series of questions to the panelists with follow-up questions. Um, and uh, there's going to be some discussion, hopefully lively, among, uh, um, among the panelists. And then we'll turn it over to audience questions. And our fearless team at Silicon Flatirons um, will um, help moderate those questions. That that team who has helped us put this together. And I have to make special mention of Amy Stepanovich, our amazing executive director, Vanessa Koppel, our wonderful director of communications, um, and Heather Martin, uh, who is our uh, director um, of, um, of, of various events. So really, really appreciate this. OK, so. Um, so our wonderful panelists that we, ha we have today, um, I'm going to begin with Alison Goodman, who is a medical epidemiologist and pediatrician for the, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have Seth Hain, uh, who is the Senior Vice President of Research and Development at EPIC. Um, Eric Huang is the co-director of Duke Forge and the assistant dean for biomedical informatics at Duke University. And Niam Yaragi, who is the assistant professor of business technology at the Miami Herbert Business School um, and at the University of Miami, as well as a fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for Technology and Innovation. So thanks to all of you for being here. And um, I'm going to um, jump straight in with my first uh, set of questions. Uh, so the first set of questions I have has to do with the sources of data that we are using uh, during uh, this difficult time to address the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, to the extent that there is a focus um, at many of the events that we put on on electronic health record data, um, I'm curious as to how EHR sources compare to other sources uh, and what other sources of data are being used. So I'm going to turn this over to Niam first, um, but then I would love to hear other people's take on this. So Niam, if you want to go ahead. Well, uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It, that is a great question. And I think one way to answer that is to look at the stage that we are when it comes uh, to dealing with COVID. At the very beginning, I remember reading those studies that were reporting uh, on the very first cases uncovered in the United States. They were mostly coming from nursing homes in the state of Washington. Uh, the data for that uh, phase of dealing with COVID were mostly coming uh, from, uh, you know, case reports of, you know, small sample studies that physicians were doing on the ground. And uh, as, as we entered the second stage, which I think was the stage of, you know, realizing that this is an epidemic in the United States and 
we have to figure out where we are standing, what is the extent of this epidemic, and what we should do was when uh, we, we relied more heavily on EHR data and coupled it with testing data, for example. But uh, as long as we do not have a vaccine, I think uh, uh, the, the third and most important uh, part of the data that we have to work with is, again, based on the stage of the epidemic that we are, and that is, you know, after that we have realized that, okay, this is the situation, we have to deal with it somehow. And uh, we, it is uh, impractical to continue to, to be quarantined for, for longer. Uh, we have to be very innovative and think about smart intelligence and science-based uh, solutions in order to, uh, you know, uh, live uh, with this, uh, unpleasant fact of life and do, at the same time do our best to uh, you know uh, uh, slow the spread and hope uh, that scientists figure out a vaccine and that is where i think uh, the most exciting uh, data types come into place uh, and let me explain this by an example a very successful example so far fingers crossed at the university of miami uh, we've been uh, open for three weeks now. We've had students on campus, and so far, we've been very successful in controlling the epidemic uh, on the campus of University of Miami uh, because uh, we have been very proactive about it, and we have tried to use every uh, resource that 21st century provides us in order to intelligently battle this virus, uh, for example, we are uh, heavily relying on information technology. We have dedicated mobile apps that students, faculty, and staff have to install on their phones. And uh, that app allows us to have something similar to a boarding pass uh, based on a set of questions that we have to answer every morning before being permitted on the campus. Uh, so those questions, for example, ask us if we physically feel okay, if we have been in contact with anybody whom we know had COVID, and questions like that. So if there are any symptoms, then uh, we wouldn't be allowed on campus, and there are staff on campus who are responsible for randomly checking those, uh, what I call them, boarding passes to be on uh, University of Miami campus. In addition to that, we have a large uh, a group of student uh, uh, volunteers who are public health ambassadors and uh, they monitor the behavior of everybody on campus and make sure that everybody are uh, following the CDC recommended guidelines uh, when it comes to wearing masks and maintaining social distancing and stuff like that. When it comes to having classes, again, uh, we have tried to be very intelligent and very vigilant about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, group students into different uh, cohorts and only bring 30% of the students in class here to maintain the social distancing. But one of the most innovative ways that you're using uh, non-conventional data to control and battle the spread of the COVID-19 is again through this app that uses our uh, GPS technology in our cell phones in order to constantly monitor the location that we are at. So uh, if, uh, if I take my cell phone with me on campus, which is not an if, it happens every day, and I forget to submit my symptoms, then I will receive a notification asking me, hey, are you sure that you don't want to submit your symptoms? And I realize that I have to do that. But more interestingly, uh, because they are monitoring our location uh, in real time, they can give us real time information about uh, the state of, uh, you know, uh, public in each of the locations. So when I want to go for lunch, I take a look at this app on my phone and I see that, oh, you know, the uh, the restaurant area is at 90% capacity. So I say, let me wait a minute and, you know, maybe maybe I'll, I'll wait about half an hour when it becomes less crowded and then I go there. And of course, University of Miami has, uh, you know, the ability to monitor the crowds in real time and just prevent, uh, you know, uh, large crowds uh, uh, before they happen. So uh, these are the, the other important thing, you know, that happened to me personally was that I received a call uh, that nobody wants to receive uh, a couple days ago from uh, the dedicated contact tracing staff at University of Miami that told me that one of my students who was present in my class 
had tested positive, and then they they were very thorough in order to make sure uh, that I had not been in close uh, contact with that particular student. And out of abundance of caution, they scheduled a, a very quick COVID testing uh, for me and then uh, reported the results uh, through an app uh, within 24 hours, which was really present. And fortunately, I tested negative for that. But all of these things, I think, are, are, are good examples of how uh, large institutions can do something, you know, uh, other than just uh, hide it. Uh, and it. shutting everything down yeah. to yeah. to use the science and technologies that uh, we have in order to to fight the virus. Thank you, thank you, Niam. Um, and so, um, so, so that and so that's interesting, just from the perspective of thinking about you know th the ways in which you collect data from beyond the HR context uh, in order to fight the virus. Um, and so, um, and so, Eric, you of course are in a slightly different situation because uh, you're also thinking about the various data streams you can use to carry out research um, on on the virus in various ways from within uh, an academic institution and a medical institution more particularly. So I'm curious about the data streams you find yourself uh, using in that context. Well, you know, uh, I also serve as the chief data officer for quality at, at Duke Health. So I, I sit on both the academic and uh, the business sides at Duke. And this actually highlights to me some of the gaps that we have, right? Because what Neam is talking about is actually a lot of data that do not conventionally live in the electronic health record, yeah. right? Yeah. And and one of the problems with the electronic health record is it, it it doesn't natively handle like, you know, GIS data or, you know, other types of data. And the other component about that, too, is when you think about the intentionality of data collection, right? In, in a case report form, you can be very structured and very particular about what you're collecting from, let's say, a patient or someone collecting data for a patient. Whereas in the EHR, you can't be. And so yeah. there's a lot of sort of inferential problems that we have because, you know, I do machine learning as well as in some ways we try to inferentially use the messy transactional data of the EHR to at least approximate some of the, the, the cleanness and the structured character of a CRF, a case mm -hmm. report form for those of you who, you know, who are not familiar with those acronyms. So th there's a tension here, right? Because we, we want to leverage transactional data from the EHR because that's what where lots of health data are, but the EHR data were never really designed to formally answer specific epidemiologic or in, you know, infectious disease problems. And uh, definitely one of the things that we need to do a better job of is thinking about how can we one, sort of the chicken or egg problem is, are there ways we can actually improve the way we collect data in an EHR so that it can be closer to sort of the, the cleanness of a clinical trial or or a case report form. Um, at the same time, the fact that it can address much larger volumes of people in real world settings, which is, in, you know, which is important because in, in, in traditional clinical trials, those are very artificial settings. Um, and we need that real world element to capture a lot of the epidemiological characteristics of disease. So I'm not, I mean, I actually think this is a hard problem. And, you know, I was interviewed by MIT Tech Review, you know, a few weeks ago, and I said, I feel like it's sort of like um, you're asking the military um, to operate with state militias who all use different calibers of bullets, and you're trying to all fight a war at a, at a national level, yet every EHR basically has a different caliber of bullet when it comes to encapsulating, you know, public health data. So it's, it's a challenge, and I think the job for us is in, to think about the future pandemics is, how can we address this chicken the egg problem? Um, yeah. But I do think that there's incredible promise in using real world data to start addressing this. But I think we've been, we've been, I mean, it's been a fire drill. I think all of us yeah. will concede that. No, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, so that, that brings me to Seth. Um, you know, you, you, um, you, you're one of the makers of the EHRs, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how, you know, you, from your vantage point, how you think about the fact that, you know, um, other sources of data are important, how the, and whether the EHR should be modified in some way to incorporate these other sources of data and what can just not be incorporated. And, you know, you, we just have to use these other sources in order to get a hand on this problem? No, I, I think that the idea of both data modification, but then also kind of to, to parts of Eric's point, workflow modification, because 
this isn't solely a question about how data is captured, but what the workflow is that is enabling and collecting that data at that point, which is in some cases distinct from say, where a, pu a, a typical public health case report might take place. And so that is one place where we start to see that differentiation occur. It also starts to provide some opportunities though for folks to use differing types of data to help improve treatment. And kind of back to Neam's point about different levels of data from the EHR being used, including obviously the monitoring data around testing and ordering. We found that, you know, looking at when COVID tests are ordered gives an early indicator in regards to likely upcoming positive accounts because the, the positive rates tend in the similar neighborhood kind of day to day. Um, but then the second set of data we've been seeing folks use from the EHR has really been around improving treatment for COVID patients or potentially COVID patients. So to your specific question, Craig, um, we've been working with an organization who built a machine learning algorithm to analyze x-rays. We don't, um, we don't have a PACS system as part of the EPIC EHR. It's not a traditional data set unstructured that's, you know, that typically sits outside, but we can bring it into our machine learning platform and the organization um, up in Minnesota ran their machine learning algorithm to predict the likelihood of COVID based on that x-ray. And then based on that prediction, both inform staff in the ED to take precautions immediately, as well as prioritize on the radiologist queue, um, that study up to the top of the list. So we start to see folks using those other data sets, not typically thought of as part of the EHR, to improve um, the care they're providing, both to potential and um, actual cases of COVID in the hospital and clinic. Absolutely. No, that, 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 that's that's very helpful. And uh, just, just a little plug for the for the reading that sort of talks about uh, so the recommended reading or, or whatever the assigned reading, whatever I'm supposed to call it, um, talks about some of the changes in the workflow at the University of Washington Health System, as well as some uh, modifications to EHR formats um, to, to to deal with some of these issues. Um, Allison, I've I've sort of saved you for last just because I feel the CDC is sitting at the top of all of this and you know handling data streams from numerous sources. And so I would love for you to, you know, maybe say a little bit about the sources you're using, additional, um, you know, an, additional vectors of information that we haven't considered so far even, um, and, uh, and, you know, what, what changes you see, you foresee happening in this context. Um, sure. And thank you for having uh, me today. So CDC overall manages and analyzes data from a variety of different sources in our everyday work, right, pre-COVID pre and will be post-COVID. Um, most of our data on cases, deaths, and laboratory testing are reported through state health departments. And so that's an avenue of data that we haven't mentioned yet today mm -hmm. um, to CDC. And that follows sort of normal public health surveillance reporting lines. All of these data streams are, you know, are well established. Um, and, and come from multiple different sources. Um, however, during COVID-19, CDC has partnered with a variety of new organizations to try to bring in novel data that can complement our more traditional um, surveillance data. Um, things like what uh, Wayne was talking about, the case report forms, um, et cetera, to give additional context, especially around this healthcare provision piece and um, contextual data that you just um, either you can't get from our other sources or it's typically more incomplete. Um, especially since in the context of COVID-19, our health departments have been you know, so overwhelmed in, uh, in doing everything that they need to do. So since March, CDC has been working with um, over 20 organizations who've been willing to uh, partner with us. Um, uh, to, to look at these new um, options and provide data pertinent to the response. Um, so our partnerships have uh, needed to follow some sort of new um, systems or protocols, different ways that we have interacted traditionally and necessarily with um, our data sources. And so it's been interesting to watch that sort of underplay. So the first step is really around understanding what the partner organization might have in terms of, you know, availability of data. So discussions about the size, source, relative strengths and weaknesses, representativeness is something we have to be very concerned about. Um, and in these 
questions, we're just trying to understand whether these available data are going to help us answer priority research or surveillance questions. Um, after that, if it looks like it, you know, there's potential for a good match there, a broad agency-wide data use agreement um, is put into place that outlines the relationship up front. And um, that's really important for, for us. Um, once FDUA is in place, um, we'll go through a process regarding a gift approval that allows us on a very preliminary basis to evaluate the data for a designated period of time. And during that process, we work collaboratively with the partner and subject matter experts to understand factors such as the timeliness of the data, frequency of data updates, again, representativeness of patient populations, availability, completeness, demographics, clinical variables, on and on, right? Um, and so if CDC finds that the data are likely to have value for the COVID-19 response, then we work with that external partner to find a mutually agreeable arrangement to license or acquire the data beyond the gift period. So, um, yeah, I think I'll stop there and can happy to answer follow-up questions. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's super helpful and a really, a really, a really great overview. Um, so I guess um, my next question, I kind of want to zero in a little bit more on the technological issues uh, because, um, you know, so we've spoken a little bit about EHRs, the use of EHRs and the integration of data there. Um, but beyond the EHR, you know, of course, there's a lot of work that's coming out of HHS in terms of building uh, a national health information network and thinking about data formats, uh, data standards and those sorts of issues. Of course, many of those um, those uh, steps haven't been finalized yet, so um, we're kind of jumping in and uh, you know using and then COVID is is of course you know, a natural guinea pig, uh, a trivial little guinea pig that we can use to test out these uh, these these really hard issues. And so, um, so I'm curious about you know if there are technological issues in general that you see COVID driving within the EHR context and beyond, um, and some of the new tools. Um, so, Seth, you 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 spoke a little bit about that, um, uh, you know, in your in your previous response, but I was wondering if you might be able to expand on it uh, a little more. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there's two things that immediately come to mind. Um, the first one is um, maybe kind of down in the weeds, but I think it's really important, and that is the data definitions mm -hmm. um, across sites are hard to standardize. Um, particularly depending on the workflow and depending on maybe if they're using a different system. One of the things we did here at Epic across the, the community of organizations using our software was early on as part of this um, pandemic, provide a set of standard data definitions um, to be able to collect and then provide to both state and federal health agencies a view of the pandemic from both the testing and a capacity perspective. And the real key to that was having a standard way to do data definitions across organizations. I think the other thing that I've seen, uh, the second piece that healthcare organizations have some challenges with on occasion has been the specificity of the type of data they wanna collect and the point in the workflow to collect it and their practice doesn't always have a natural entry point for answering those questions, say, maybe at time of ordering in the same way that one might want. And so figuring out how to capture those, maybe say asynchronously via a patient app um, while they're scheduling the appointment might make more sense. So I, I think there's a couple of technological challenges there, both of which there are solutions to. Um, but it does require kind of rolling up your sleeves uh, and, and jointly defining those to, to get consistency. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's um, that. I think that that's really helpful um, because you know it's in the weeds, but it is really important. Um, uh, Eric, um, so you know, asking you to put on an, your other hat as a practicing physician, um, I'm curious about your thoughts regarding the technology that's available to you um, in uh, providing patient care, and you know, additional technology, different technology you'd like to see in the case of uh, COVID uh, when it comes to. Actually accessing and using health data? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, obviously we've talked about structured and unstructured data, right? And, and, and for those of you who are not in the weeds and data, you know, free text clinic notes are unstructured, whereas, you know, using click, click and drag menus gives you structured data. Radiologic imaging data is unstructured. Um, and so there's a ton of information in unstructured data that 
is difficult to extract. And I think that's part of the challenge of machine learning is to start, you know, pulling signal out of those types of unstructured texts or images in order to, to identify signal. And in many cases, these signals could quite, could certainly be relevant for our management of COVID-19 patients, absolutely. Um, but, you know, on top of that, and I think it's probably touching on the issue that Seth was addressing and then really sort of getting a little bit more concrete, because I do think it is worth getting in the weeds. In the end, this is about getting the weeds, we have to. Yeah. Um, is that there needs to be ability to transport this information around amongst us in a standard way, right? And, and I know Neam's been involved in talking a lot about this is, you know, at the end of the Obama administration, the 21st Century Cures Act was, was passed as a bi, you know, bipartisan legislation. Um, and one of the parts of that is this concept of interoperability. And then there's also the negative interoperability is data blocking. And you know, ironically, it, it the, in March, you know, probably just within weeks before the, the pandemic really hit our shores or that we knew it hit our shores, let's put it that way, um, the rulemaking from the, the Office of the National Coordinator for, uh, for that regulation actually came out. And part of that was you talking about a data interoperability standard, which actually works well for both structured and unstructured data because you can sort of package up unstructured data within that. And it's called the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. So if one did come up with standard case definitions, for example, then FHIR would be a great way to represent it. So if I was talking about the need for us to have standardized caliber of bullets, you know, uh, you know, in the military, well, this is the standardized caliber of health exchange, you know, uh, information exchange. And I think that's key because, you know, every, every hospital is a flower, is a distinct snowflake. And until we can join these data together in a very effective way, and unfortunately that means a lot of manual work because a lot of the data that Allison is seeing is compiled in a very manual way. Mm -hmm. um, we need that. And I think for the next pandemic, you know, I, I sure as heck hope that more of us uh, in our health systems and in our information systems have really embraced fire as the sort of interoperability exchange uh, standard for a lot of this information. I think that's absolutely necessary because, you know, when you're when you're there in the front line taking care of the patient, you just want to get your work done. If you can also know that that can be shipped to someone else in a standardized way that they can understand, wow, that would be amazing for collectively for us to manage a future pandemic. Unfortunately, we can't do it now. The horse is that too far out of the barn. No, it's actually, it's actually, would, if you don't mind, Craig, yeah. I, I would just plug, Eric really took that to the next step, which was important, that not only is it about data definitions and workflow, but then that exchange afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think now is the time, kind of to your point, Eric, to start thinking about how do we do that consistently? And I think FHIR is one excellent approach um, so that we're ready in the future. Because unfortunately, we, we may find ourselves having this conversation again, and it'd be good to have this consistently applied now um, yeah so definitely a point of yeah, no, no, that, that's super helpful. And, I, and I'm going to put Niam in the hot seat in a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes because I want to, you know, get down into the, into the weeds of 21st century QRs and data blocking. But I'll give him a couple of moments to collect himself uh, and collect myself because you guys are already thinking about the next pandemic and I'm not sure that I can get through this one. But, but before we get there, I want to, I want to talk to Alison for a second um, and ask, you know, so, so, you know, Eric mentioned that, you know, you're collecting data that's been manually compiled uh, you know, you, ra you raised some questions regarding, you know, representativeness of data and other issues. Um, and so I'm, I'm just sort of curious as if, you know, if there are some technological issues uh, while we're in the issue of technology that you find CDC facing on a regular basis, if there are solutions that you could maybe foresee CDC playing with um, in the future to identify that. Sure, thanks. I mean, um, the data challenges that the federal government faces are no different, right, than the data challenges that many of, you know, the entities that we're describing today face. Um, but some of the real challenges we're having in the context of COVID, which really have been along for ages, but like you're saying, in the context of the pandemic, it really um, uh, brings a sense of urgency to deal with them. So one is data linkages. This is a huge issue for us. 
um, as we're bringing in data from, you know, multiple sources. So it's a linkage within data sets, right, or across those data sets. And this is just really critical for, you know, a number of the priority issues that we have around surveillance, tracking outcomes over time, laboratory testing, um, making sure that we don't, you know, have, have um, duplicate issues, that deduplication, by the way, is also a huge issue for us um, to deal with. Um, we've also found with these gigantic data sets, um, you know, that we're using now, uh, some of which are bigger than um, what I've heard CBC's dealt with before, um, analytic processing power has been an issue that we've had to take on um, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Um, and it's forcing the agency into, um, you know, uh, some more novel, up-to-date, you know, mechanisms, um, like, you know, into the cloud. Um, but it's really exciting because those opportunities have now become available. Our analysts are so, so happy. And uh, <laughs> we're moving a lot faster. Um, interoperability, I'm so glad that that was brought up. This is a tremendous issue for the government and understanding um, what's going on. Standards and data net definitions are absolutely critical. And this goes for, you know, clinically, I certainly, um, you know, I still practice myself. I, my normal work is in child obesity and nutrition. You know, we absolutely need standards in that realm, but for mm -hmm. sure, you know, in, in public health and COVID and these pandemics, we have to be ready to go, just like you're saying, so that, you know, the information at point A can be compared accurately with information in point B, and we're all speaking the same language. CDC has certainly invested some, uh, a lot of resources, both in terms of human resources and some financial and under, you know, really trying to understand the um, potential for fire. Um, for public health purposes and use cases, and we're really excited to be um, demonstrating some of those um, this year. Uh, privacy preserving issues, confidentiality issues um, of the individual whose data are shared, again, absolutely critical for us as all, you know, for all the, the entities we're talking about, um, and secure storage. Uh, but also secure use of the data when you've got a lot of analysts making sure that everybody is really, you know, very clear on the rules of behavior and the terms of the data use agreements. Um, so, you know, all of these, I think, are fairly standard issues, but certainly on the tops of our minds. Um, and with all that said, CDC has been working, you know, not only to display our data publicly, and this includes some of the electronic healthcare data that we're bringing in, but also to provide data sets that we can publicly. Um, you know, pursuant to obviously, you know, use agreements and whatnot, um, but with appropriate privacy protections um, in place. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's super helpful. Um, and, and actually that's, uh, that's a useful point uh, for us to move on from technology uh, considerations to thinking about um, sort of justice considerations, specifically related to privacy, to equity, uh, both um, based on race, based on geography, um, and, and similar issues before we start talking about government policy, 21st century cures and all of that. So uh, when it comes to privacy considerations, um, I'm curious, um, you know, uh, Alison, and what do you what do you sort of see as the as the protections that are being implemented? What are some of the challenges you face as a government body in ensuring that privacy and security is maintained? Thank you. So CDC applies very stringent privacy protections in the creation of all of our data sets. Um, this includes removal of fields that contain identifying information, um, pretty rigorous data suppression rules. Um, so that no geographic information is revealed on areas with, um, you know, for example, fewer than 100 cases. Um, that uh, another example would be no, de no demographic or stratifying field information like age group or sex, race, race ethnicity, um, health department name, you know, all of these issues um, is revealed on factors with fewer than 25 cases, for example. So there's all sorts of rules in place such as those. Um, and no, we have to be so careful that no unique confidential information is disclosed on cases that share geography and demographic factors. Yeah. So before releasing any data, CDC systematically verifies um, that redactions occur um, as expected and that no case records violate established privacy protection rules. Um, and additional details of these well-established privacy protection rules can be provided to who's interested upon request. 
No, that's uh, that's really helpful, um, Seth. Um, for, so, from your perspective, you know, working in the you know in one of the technology epicenters uh, for the epidemic um, and for dealing with the epidemic, I'm curious as to the privacy and security protections you know you find uh, your organization implementing in the products it it puts out. Yeah, you know, I, uh, many of the ones that Allison already alluded to are standard best practices. Yeah, where as you are defining the data definitions for what you're collecting in these contexts to be able to share, you also put in place mechanisms from a de-identification perspective to make sure that that possibility of triangulating who the individual was um, is reduced, if not eliminated, um, where you can. And so we work with the healthcare organizations to put those in place. And then, of course, you wrap around both a series of technical solutions such as encryption, um, as well as policies from um, the human angle to reduce the likelihood of some sort of event occurring. So, you know, yeah. you make sure you have a multi-layered approach there um, to protecting it. So do you, do you find that there's conflicts often, right? Because, you know, um, on one hand, you've got, you know, Epic who wants to put out a product that is of assistance, right, and can, you know, provide all kinds of support. Um, but on the other hand, you want to maintain privacy and security. So I'm wondering, you know, if you found that there have been times where there's a dilemma of, uh, you know, how do you get the maximum use out of the data while at the same time protecting privacy and security and how you may have dealt with those situations? Um, more often than not, folks are directly using the data for research purposes this is data that the healthcare organizations hold themselves, yeah. which they've captured through our software. And they yeah. are using identifiable data in some contexts mm -hmm. for the purposes of research. Mm -hmm. um, and then going through traditional IRB style approaches for that work. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's through those standard mechanisms that they continue to, um, to perform the research COVID times or not. So what I'm hearing Seth say is ask Eric. So Eric, um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm joking, but Eric, uh, I was going to come to you in a second to ask you how, you know, you're, um, you're sort of grappling with, uh, with that dilemma. Well, they're, they're, you're right. There's a real tension there, right? Because if you're going to do contact tracing, for example, you got to ask a lot of pretty private information, like who, who have you been spending time with, you know, and then you have to Ask, you know, where has that, where have you spent time with people? These are all very, in many cases, you know, for most people, information that they tend to think of as being very private. Now, obviously, in a public health emergency, there are things that we've got to do, but there is a real tension there. So you can de-identify data sets and, and show things at an aggregate, you know, high level. But at some point, because, you know, we've clinicians have to take care of people, right? So in the end, I mean, you have to deal with identifiable information. So I, I, the way I like to think about it, and there's no easy answer, right, is that just like with precision medicine, it's getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. We also need the right access to the right data at the right time by the right sort of role. And then that's where policy is gonna be important, right? Because policy sort of sets the rules for, okay, it's okay if you're, let's say the, the secretary of, you know, health and human services for this state, you know, you need to be able to have access to certain data that other people should not have access to, or the individual clinician needs to have access to their individual patient data. So um, there's no easy answers there because there's always a dynamic tension between sort of that privacy um, and the ability to actually get work done and actually directly help people. And I think one of the policy gaps that we have in, in this country and, and actually all around the world is what do we consider to be misuse of data, right? Because if we want data to be private, we're, I assume it's because we don't want people to misuse that data in a certain way. And that's one right. thing that's, that's frankly missing in HIPAA, for instance. Yeah. It's, it's all about keeping people out of the data. But once people have access to data, there's really not that many reliefs. Uh, GINA for genetics, genetic information was sort of the first attempt at doing that. But do we need to think of something like DINA, which is, you know, the data, you know, information, non-discriminatory act or something like that? What, what do we want to define in this country as things that we feel uncomfortable with, you know, when people do ultimately have access to uh, private data? And that, I do think that that's a, a gap in our regulatory regime in this country.
Yeah, absolutely. And just from the legal perspective, I think one of the problems we face as lawyers is you know, it's easier to say there's no access to the information because it's very hard if someone gets access to the information to prove whether or whether or, or, or not that information played a role in making a decision. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that balancing that out is, is pretty hard. Um, so you spoke a little bit about using the data for, right, for, for the correct purposes. And so um, I was curious, um, you know, so we do know that minority communities are being affected the most by COVID. Um, and so I'm curious how your organization, um, you know, or how, how Duke is sort of thinking about that problem and, um, you know, trying to maybe use uh, technology, use data in, the, in, the, in, the, in that context to, uh, to address that, that harm. Yeah, as it comes as no surprise that uh, within our communities, uh, the Latinx population, let's say in Durham, where Duke is, is, has been the most, you know, differentially impacted by, by the pandemic. Um, and of course, that brings up, you know, again, privacy issues where people have, you know, fears about citizenship, you know, and ICE and things like that. And you do contact tracing, it's like, well, you know, there's, there's that tension. Um, and there's also just the fact that the disparities in terms of our ability to reach out to communities that have, you know, greater needs are, are I mean, those exist. And, and we would be naive to say that those are not issues. So some of the approaches that, well, one of the approaches we've taken, in fact, um, the CDC actually just funded us for, uh, for doing this kind of work, is one approach we've taken is something called, we, we call respondent-driven sampling. Because, you know, how do we get the right test to the right people? And, and how do we, you know, as opposed to just waiting for people to call and say, I got symptoms or show up in the ER and I got symptoms. So respondent-driven sampling has been used in HIV where, if someone tests positive, you actually give them uh, essentially coupons for them to hand to people that they've been in contact with so that they can in, in turn get tested. So this hopefully drives testing into communities rather than sort of passively waiting for them to come, get back to you. Because frankly, uh, you know, contact tracing is not at a robust enough level where we're actually pushing that out enough. So this gives us a lighter weight way to send tests out into communities. And our hope is that what that'll do is for um, communities that don't have, that you know, are not as advantaged as, as some of our surrounding communities, that this kind of respondent driven sampling design can actually get testing deeper into sort of social networks, uh, community networks, et cetera. So that's, one approach we're taking. I, I can't tell you whether, it's a hypothesis. I can't tell you whether it'll work. Um, but I think it's one of our attempts to really send tests out into communities as opposed to just sit back and wait for people to show up. Absolutely. Oh, no, that, that, that's really interesting. Um, and I look forward to seeing the results of that. Um, you know, Niam, you, of course, are in a very, uh, you know, a, a very diverse city and a very diverse university. Um, you know, the president of your university, I remember you, you mentioning to me, used to be the, the health minister for, for, the, for, for the country of Mexico. Um, I know the dean of the law school uh, very well, and he is, um, you know, uh, a, an LGBT Cuban man, right? So it's just a very diverse city, a very diverse institution. And so um, I'm curious about some of the uh, the issues, the steps you you know you you see in within your institution, within the city as a whole, in trying to address uh, from a data perspective the disparate impact uh, that COVID is having. Yeah, absolutely, and let me uh, give you uh, examples from my personal experience. Uh, I, I told you the you know the one of the times I got tested for COVID was when university contacted me and they. Uh, you know, managed it beautifully. Then the other time was uh, back, uh, you know, a couple months ago when I was in Connecticut and uh, I had visited Miami because I wanted to come rent a house here. And, uh, you know, for, for obvious reason, I was very worried that I may have uh, uh, caught the virus. So I wanted to get tested. And uh, I, uh, I could arrange a telehealth visit with my primary care physician uh, while I was driving in my car from JFK uh, to Stanford in Connecticut. And uh, uh, she, she uh, met me on uh, this telehealth uh, app of hers and uh, ordered me the test. And I went directly to the lab, got tested, waited there for two hours, and they gave me the negative results. And that was when I went home to my, uh, to my family. And then uh, I, I, I thought to myself that, look, I, I could do all of that because I had access to good internet connectivity. 
And believe it or not, about 25% of American adults, as of now, do not have access to broadband internet. So, uh, you know, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to use all these amazing benefits of telehealth? One of the smallest things right now is to arrange a visit with your primary care physician who can order you uh, uh, a test order because you cannot take it otherwise, uh, unless you're willing to risk going to an ER, for example, uh, in order to in order to you know uh, get diagnosed uh, uh, with this uh, virus uh, at, as early as possible, so that you know there there are high chances that you can you can uh, deal with it, and there is better chances for contact tracers, for example. You know if you get tested today uh, rather than two weeks from now, it's too late to have. Uh, Contract, uh, you know, uh, contact with many other people, and they, that you, you may have been a super spreader yourself. So uh, I think one of the reasons, you know, uh, that uh, uh, underprivileged communities have been, uh, uh, you know, suffering from this uh, epidemic more than other communities, to some extent, is because of their lack of access to technology. You know, uh, we we can. Uh, we can, uh, you know, have our uh, children stay at home and uh, do not go to school or do not go on campus uh, because we have such good internet connectivity. And you know, you have two or three uh, teenage, uh, uh, you know, kids at home. They can be on their Zoom, and you can also be on Zoom, do your things because you have access to broadband internet. And it is so ubiquitous in our lives that we take it for granted. And we sometimes forget the fact that there are many, many people that do not have access to that luxury, no matter you know uh, what they do. It's just because there are no internet service providers in their area. Even even if they're what they're where ISVs, it's, it's going to be so expensive that you know it's going to be a significant cost for them to use these services. And because of lack of access to these technologies, they wouldn't they would you know uh, wouldn't be able to use the benefits of the technologies that are built upon broadband internet and or would need to expose themselves unnecessarily to the things that they could have avoided had they had access to you know uh, broadband internet i'll give you just a, another simple example i'm pretty sure that all of us have been using over the past couple of months and that is uh, instacart you know uh, you you or ordering groceries online you know that is a uh, that is a, a, a magical technology that we're using, but and we forget that many people do not have the capability to to use these technologies, and they are the people that are also, to begin with, are more vulnerable to to complications of COVID. So if I get the COVID, chances are that I'd be able to to fight it because uh, thanks God I'm in good health condition. But uh, you know the people, and, and speaking on averages, the people who uh, you know do not have access to broadband internet are also more likely to have pre-existing conditions and suffer more from from catching the virus. So you know these the lack of lack of access to technology or disparities in access to technologies would uh, would put them uh, in in higher risk and hinder their ability their ability to to heal from this virus yeah no absolutely and and there are just so many other sort of structural harms um you know access to health insurance you know um housing situation where you've got to live in you know relatively crowded conditions um you know political um uh you know uh and, and just a range of issues so in fact i'm going to give a quick plug um i'm also um doing a um a series uh, with harvard law school on race and health um and uh running a moderated symposium and a, a, a panel there in a couple of weeks so i've put that in the chat for those folks who might who might find that interesting just thinking about race and health you know at a, at a broader level as including police violence etc but um, before um, but but I won't go further down that track uh, but you know just thinking about the issue of health data when it comes to racial minorities in the COVID epidemic I'm sure CDC has several perspectives on this and so Alison I was wondering if you could if you could speak to that yes, Scott thank you um, clearly, the disparities in transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and outcomes amongst minority groups is of utmost concern and a public health priority. 
Um, CDC has been working on lots of different levels on this, but um, including uh, state and jurisdictional health departments to improve reporting of critical case surveillance data elements such as race and ethnicity, but also pregnancy status, hospitalization status, other really key data elements. Um, and although the reporting of some of these data elements remains low, state and jurisdictional health departments um, have continued to make improvements in ensuring the completeness of data collection for COVID-19. So between um, April 2nd to August 11th of this year, the proportion of case reports with complete information on race increased from 21 to 60 percent. So mm -hmm. still optimal, but a major improvement. And the case reports with complete information on ethnicity um, increased from 18 to 50 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so room to grow, but making good improvements. Um, uh. CDC has an office of the Chief Health and Equity Officer um, that is working within CDC and across the U.S. government response to reduce health disparities associated with COVID-19. Um, this is my first experience where the Chief Health, Ed Health, I can't say that, Chief Health Equity Officer um, is completely embedded in the response and has like sort of this pan presence. And it's really been um, a great asset, I think, uh, in, in trying to think through these issues. Yeah. Um, so I, there are opportunities for healthcare and public health to collaborate though, right? To tackle um, these mutual needs and concerns. So a few examples of ways that we've thought about this would be um, standardizing race and ethnicity data fields. So we keep coming back to the standardizations, but in electronic health records, right? Including providing an expanded number of categories to better capture how individuals self-identify. Otherwise, we have to roll it up, right, into such um, high-level groups that it really isn't, um, you know, cap capturing the, the, the many different ways that people self-identify identify now in terms of their race and ethnicity. Um, providing incentives to make it easier to capture more complete data at the point of care on race and ethnicity would be really fantastic. Or automating that data capture um, to decrease burden on, you know, busy healthcare providers. Those some are, are no, that, that's that's super helpful. Um, and um, and so and so, you know, it, there's just there's just so much room to grow. And uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it sounds like important steps are being taken. And so I kind of want to abstract up um, from the collection of data. You know, you mentioned you were working with states um, on collecting race and ethnicity data. But I'm sort of curious about the collection of data overall from states. You know, I, have some states been doing better than others? You don't have to name any names. Uh, but but I'm sort of curious as to you know how CDC has you know found the state response and in, in certain situations where states may not have been collecting as much data um, or collecting data in ways that CDC found most more useful how CDC may have stepped in to, to address that gap so state and jurisdictional health departments are some of the unsung heroes yeah. uh, in this pandemic they do amazing work and have been working to modernize their public health data infrastructure while responding to you know, the biggest public health threat and pandemic of our, you know, of our time. Um, CDC is working though with these states right, and jurisdictions to modernize the traditional public health data flow to decrease burden on healthcare providers, but also public health. So examples of that would be electronic case reporting um, and electronic laboratory reporting where we've made really great um, strides over the last couple of years and in the context of COVID. Uh, but the really key piece here is that data moves at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. So it's imperative that we maintain and grow the relationships that CDC has built with these state and late local public health partners over time. Um, and over the past several decades, certainly, uh, if state or jurisdictions need help, we provide that assistance to the best of our abilities. That's super helpful. Um, and I'm also curious in terms of collecting data from other government agencies. So, of course, you can imagine that there are agencies like DOJ, specifically, you can imagine Bureau of Prisons, you know, DHS, etc., um, all who engage with, um, you know, vulnerable groups uh, in various ways, um, and groups specifically where COVID has, you know, been uh, quite prevalent. So I'm curious as to CDC's interaction with collecting data and working with the data from those uh, federal agencies. Sure. Um, so CDC regularly works with other uh, federal agencies to not only provide data for the federal response, but also to assist them with data analytic needs. Mm -hmm. um, COVID in a lot of ways has been unprecedented 
in terms of interagency collaboration. I mean, just for example, on my, my own experience on the response, I've been on for about 140 days of the last six or seven months. I've worked with ONC, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, FDA, NIH, um, every center, I think, of CDC. Um, and, and we could name you know, a lot more. So with interagency collaboration, it's exciting um, and it's happening. We're working hard to you know, capitalize on each other's assets and um, avoid as much as possible duplication of effort. Yeah. No, and so, so that's very helpful. And so I know one question our listeners probably have um, is, you know, there were news reports recently of certain data uh, flows and data channels being redirected away from CDC towards HHS. Um, and so I'm curious if, uh, you know, you're able to speak a little bit more to that. I can understand that there are confidential elements uh, to that question. So, uh, I, so I was just wondering if, you, if, if there are any thoughts you can, you can offer and any additional light you can shed there. Sure, a little bit. Um, so HHS protects, which is the you know new sort of data um, repository that HHS has been you know really moving forward with in the context of COVID, and where healthcare data are now being reported um, as a platform that allows access to multiple data sets right across. HHS agencies, departments, um, and also, you know, in some instances to public entities is a phenomenal idea, right? And a platform that should be moving forward and we're excited, to, you know, to exist. As to directions of data flow and recent changes, um, that's something that uh, is really outside of my role, so I can't. Yeah. No, that's that, that, that's fair, uh, but but that's really helpful because you know you, you're sort of thinking about the interaction of other sub agencies within HHS, and some of those sub agencies are responsible for implementing this wonderful thing that we've referred to already, this 21st Century Cures Act. Um, and so, Niam, I'm sort of curious as to what do you see the effect of COVID. So we've had you know multiple drafts come out of the Trusted Exchange Framework Common Agreement, which is supposed to set up this national network of health data exchange across the country. We've had the you know, draft data blocking rules come out. We've had, you know, a range of things come out. So do you feel that COVID is going to alter any of that? COVID is going to accelerate any of that? Um, you know, what's the effect of COVID on the legacy of 21st century cures? So let me uh, answer that by giving you yet again another example of my uh, We uh, I just did the safety and security orientation training when I joined the University of Miami. And there I learned that all the building codes uh, completely got uh, you know, revised and they went through the roof after we experienced uh, one or two Cat 4 hurricanes that devastated the, the uh, South Florida region, including the University of Miami. Uh, and I thought to myself, it's just like uh, these new standards that we have uh, it's not that people before those hurricanes were not aware of these standards or didn't know that they have to build a stronger the structures, it's that they thought it's not going to happen to them and they didn't feel the need to build the stronger structures until that it literally hit them. And that was the moment that they came to the realization that this is important, we have to uh, come up with these new standards, and more importantly, we have to comply with these standards. One of the criticisms that I've had about uh, uh, regulating the standards was the fact that, look, uh, we, you know, we, we hadn't had such regulations in other industries, or if, if we had, it hasn't been as strict as people wanted it to be in the health industry, yet we had much better levels of interoperability in in let's say finance industry. And the reason for that is because uh, in the example of finance industry, for example, banks came to the realization that, hey, we have to have interoperability so that we can have an operating ATM network and make money off of it and have uh, our customers satisfied. And then they came together and, and created this network that you, know, you, can, you can use your Bank of America card to take money out of your Chase ATM. Uh, now, when it came to the 21st Century uh, Act, it is great, you know, 
Uh, however, I think uh, the people, the folks at ONC are, are are really happy. You know, the silver lining of COVID-19 for them is that you know they 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 can relax because uh, uh, the the analogy that I make here is that COVID was like a natural disaster uh, in which people react completely differently. Uh, you know, I may be uh, very uh, protective uh, of, of my belongings uh, for example I am of course and I wouldn't like uh, any stranger to come into my house but if there is an earthquake uh, God forbid or if there is a hurricane and I see that people need help I'd be the very first one to open the door to my house and I'd be the very first one to go you know stand in the line to to donate blood you know and that is not me it's the human nature and we will see it over and over again, whenever there is a disaster happening, not only in America, everywhere in the world, you know, this is the human nature. People come together and they uh, sacrifice. They do mm -hmm. things that they would otherwise uh, not do. And and the COVID-19 is uh, and the, the flow of data is is a very similar analogy because it's a it's a disaster. And now people are opening up uh, their their silos and they're. They're, they're uh, building up these bridges between their organizations and enabling data flow in ways that we couldn't imagine before it uh, because yeah. I think, uh, they do not have the, uh, the, the concerns about economics uh, and potential political uh, uh, issues that they had before. Not that they don't have them, they still have them, but they, do, but they are not as that important. You know? yeah. What is important so is saving lives and getting out yeah. of this pandemic right now and yeah. anything else just just uh, you know loses its importance in comparison so so and and i think you know we're 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 seeing a huge uptick in in interoperability and if i wanted to do a uh, you know difference in differences uh, analysis uh, to see whether or not this policy worked i'd probably see empirically that it had a huge impact but because you know it coincided with uh, with uh, you know that 21st century act getting into uh, effect but that that's not the real reason the real reason is that you know i think people people put their childish uh, concerns behind and they they said look this is something that we're all in together literally and we have to fight it together and one of the uh, smallest things that we can do uh, to to uh, to to basically pay our dues is to is to open up our silos and enable yeah. interoperability so yeah, so that's and so that that's really interesting, right? To see that dynamic, and so um, and and so, and you're speaking for, um, about this from the perspective of someone who studies it um, and is one of the uh, national authorities on this. Um, Seth, um, I'm going to close out uh, with by asking you a question, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. So, folks, if you want to put in your questions, um, so Seth, from the perspective of someone um, who is you know um, in an organization that's partnering with ONC, um, that's one of the regulated entities by ONC, um, you know, I'm sort of curious if uh, what Niam says, you know, if, if you would like to add anything more, if there's, uh, if there's anything additional that you would like to, um, you know, note. You know, in, a, in addition to continuing to work with healthcare organizations to further what we're kind of referring to as provider interoperability, right? Sharing of data elements via fire or previous standards, you know, back to HL7 and some of the, some of the earlier versions of it. Um, and between HIPAA regulated entities, another thing that came out of 21st century cures was kind of more of an app compatibility standard mm, yeah, yes, where yes, yes, yes. organizations were sharing data that was uh, HIPAA controlled organizations were sharing data with patient applications. So one of the things we're doing from a development side here is helping gives individuals transparency and control over what they're sharing and with whom and what through their phones, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it might be an app request weight and some other uh, BMI say characteristics from a healthcare organization, a HIPAA controlled entity, but along with it inside of the package that's being shared might come other information they don't wanna share. Um, and so we're, we're building on the development side capabilities to provide that type of transparency and control to individuals as well. Kind of back to some of the earlier conversations we were having around justice and helping folks understand how data is flowing between. Yeah. 
No, that's, so that's, that's super helpful and a nice way to tie up um, our discussion um, and before we now move to audience questions. Um, and so um, I, I, I don't know if uh, you folks have uh, access to the Q&A sc uh, screen. Oh, you do, perfect. So, uh, so I'm actually in the answered sections um, and a couple of, a couple of questions that, um, there. So um, given the announcement a few days ago from Google and Apple about building proximity detection into their OS, will campuses be able to tie that into, into the system and actually more than campuses I'd be curious about uh, you know access to, by public health uh, entities to to that data um, and uh, and other you know other organizations I know there's been controversy and negotiation I should say between Google Apple and you know public health entities etc about that so um, so I, I'm happy to take a volunteer for this question but I do wonder if Ali if, if you want to jump in and maybe mention uh, talk about maybe the discussions that Google and Apple have been having with public health entities? Um, I have to say, I'm not familiar um, with that. I would love to pass this one off to another panelist. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, anyone else want to jump in? You see, I put a written answer in. Um, oh, oh, I see. So I didn't, uh, I see, I see. Oh, Eric, yeah. thank you. Okay, so Eric, so, yeah, Eric, do you, do you want to answer the question in real time then? <laughs> I mean, I, I've been uh, part of how our campus has been first preparing and now managing uh, the pandemic on our campus. And uh, we're lucky so far in North Carolina not to be one of the campuses that have closed, but I, I will never uh, wave the flag of victory yet. But, you know, one thing is, um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of discussion about, about this technology. And, and I think, you know, I. I frankly applaud Google and Apple for really trying to, you know, make an effort to help here. Um, I think with many people's already existing concerns with privacy, probably more with Google than necessarily with Apple. Um, I do think that there's hesitation there. And, and from the campus standpoint, actually, when, when, we, when we've considered whether we want to use the, those kinds of technologies, mostly, you know, Bluetooth related, um, on our campuses and helping manage the pandemic for our students. I think that the hesitation one is, you know, that Bluetooth proximity is, is, is not, is imperfect. Um, we already have a lot of levers in terms of information by, you know, we know what rooms the students are assigned to. We know, uh, what doors they swipe into. We know their class schedules and things like that. So from a contact tracing perspective, we already have a pretty rich set of information. Uh, now that doesn't exist outside of campus, so I, I do I do leave the question about whether you know state public health entities will you know potentially find that useful. But for certainly for us thinking about campuses at, at Duke, for example, uh, we we basically elected not to try using those technologies at this point in time. Yeah, no, that, that, that's that that that's super helpful because uh, you know, and that's why I was sort of thinking beyond campuses because I know my university does knows everything I do. Um, <laughs> but, you know. Um, so, 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 so there, so there we are. Um, and then, and then another excellent question, which was um, about uh, the issue regarding data segmentation. Um, uh, you know, in, in ways that would also help protect privacy, but also allow use the use of data. Um, and Eric uh, was kind enough to ask and uh, answer that question as well, which was precisely about the point you made earlier. Fires access to um, to uh, uh, fires ability to, um, to 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 engage in data segmentation to allow for both uh, privacy and security while at the same time allowing data use. I just wanted to add one point about the Google and Apple narrative. So there was actually um, a discussion I should mention with uh, various uh, public health entities around the country, and, and now I'm speaking. I'm jumping in as a semi panelist here myself. Uh, there were there were several um, public health um, entities that wanted access to more data. Data, um, and Google and Apple, out of security considerations, uh, declined to provide them uh, with that data. And many public health entities said, well, in that case, the data are useless. And I'm not a data expert, so I can't speak to that. Um, there, were, there were some concerns. You know, so I live in a condo building, uh, and you know, there's a wall between me and my neighbor. I actually have no idea what my neighbor looks like, uh, because I ado adopt a New York mentality to these things, right? Um, and so, um, but at the same time, uh, my, the, the, the proximity detectors would suggest that I am close to my neighbor, right? So there's a, there was a lot of uh, questions about the quality of the data, as, as Eric mentioned. Um, 
And then, um, and then finally, um, I, I, I guess we have one last question, uh, which is about the, um, the, the use of contact tracing personal devices for social analysis, which might have chilling implications for freedom of association, personal privacy, et cetera. So this goes back to my question earlier about balancing the need for privacy with the additional streams of data uh, that, that, that we are seeing. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, um, I, and I am, and I, and I am curious because I, I had read, Seth. I might be completely wrong about this, but I had read that uh, various EHRs were adopting technologies that would allow public health authorities to, you know, work with public health authorities to sort of say, oh, you know, these are hotspots in certain neighborhoods, etc. And it may not be EHR providers; it may have actually been a whole different set of entities. But I'm kind of curious about, you know, warning systems. If if that's it, if if, if providers are doing that, or whether I should just go to Allison on. On, for that question, I, I I can briefly mention answer it, and then probably Allison. We we are working to, with state and federal public health organizations to share data where health where the broader healthcare community has agreed to participate through those standard data definitions that I I mentioned. That does not involve any contact tracing or individual record data, it is aggregate counts. So you can get a sense, say, by a geography of hotspots, um, but it's not down to say, you know, your condo, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. as an example, so. Yeah, it's helpful, thank you. Uh, Allison, I was wondering if you wanted to, to weigh in on that. Um, first of these are really relevant issues that are discussed a lot. Um, you know, there's uh, interesting legal authorities that are allowed to public health entities, right, during emergency response, so exemptions to the HIPAA privacy rule, et cetera, um, that allow, you know, collection of personally identifiable information um, to respond to pandemic. So those rules are, are you know, exist and um, but are challenging when we work with healthcare entities. Um, we've worked with some mobility data companies, et cetera, where um, you, you know, they definitely want to bring in their attorneys, right, to, to review this. And it's hard to get comfortable um, with those exemptions, um, even with the privacy you know, restrictions and, and careful way that you know, the government handles these data. Um, but there's always mistrust, and that's understandable. Um, but um, yeah, so I think this is just an ongoing issue that you know deserves more discourse, right, in various settings. Yeah. Oh, that's that, that's, and I think that that uh, is true for so many of these issues. I think we're learning as we are doing, and uh, I thank those of you, Niam. Eric, Allison, Seth, who are actually doing, uh, who have come to share what you have learned. So thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, again, I want to thank our redoubtable Silicon Flatiron st staff, uh, Amy Stepanovich, our executive director, Vanessa uh, Koppel, our senior events manager, and Heather Martin, the program um, coordinator for uh, putting all of this together. Um, and uh, thanks to our audience for attending, and I look forward to seeing you at the next Silicon Flatirons event. Thanks again. Uh, and have a good evening.